You're listening to episode 155 of Mid-America Reformed Seminary's Roundtable Podcast. In this broadcast, the faculty of Mid-America discuss theology and cultural issues from a Reformed perspective. I'm Jared Luchibor, Director of Marketing. Thank you for tuning in. In today's episode, Reverend Andrew Compton and Dr. Alan Strange reflect on a critical cultural, political, and religious piece in our day and age, that of the recent abortion ruling this past summer by the Supreme Court. Our fine professors are going to kick off a four-part series on the gospel for a post-Roe society, beginning with some background to Roe v. Wade and the Christian response to it. Well, it's uh, good, as always, to be here, uh, Jared, with you and my good colleague, uh, Andrew, who is professor of Old Testament, uh, soon to be doctor, (laughs) uh, we hope. And uh, this is Alan Strange in church history. And um, we're today talking about really the Dobbs case, you might say, the recent decision that overturned Roe and Casey uh, and that has impacted so much of our culture. And maybe we could begin by just talking a little bit about uh, some of the background to this. Roe v. Wade, I think many of our listeners would be familiar with that in a general way. And again, let me thank all of you who are our listeners and our supporters. We're always grateful to have you. And uh, we know a lot of people have expressed an interest in this because uh, abortion, which is the taking of an unborn life. It can be done naturally. There are miscarriages. Uh, that is a, um, any taking of an unborn life is is properly an abortion. We're particularly concerned about induced abortions, uh, the taking of an unborn life uh, through the decision of mother or parents, mm-hmm. uh, along with medical uh, personnel involved in that. And uh, Roe v. Wade had a significant impact on that. That was really what you might call, the legal folks call it a landmark case that was decided back in uh, January of 1973 by a 7-2 to margin on the Supreme Court. Justice Harry Blackman uh, wrote the majority opinion for the court in this case. And basically what Roe v. Wade did was, was to find a constitutional right to set forth that the Constitution itself gives the right, gives a woman a right uh, to an abortion under certain conditions. And what they based this on largely, I don't want to get too uh, technical here. I don't know how much our hearers are interested in or know about constitutional law, but based on the 14th Amendment and what's called the Due Process Clause, they found something called substantive due process, which means that there is a right, not a direct right. Nobody argues that the Constitution says that the framers said or any amendment said that you have the right to take an unborn life. But looking at the 14th Amendment, Together with the Bill of Rights, which is the first 10 amendments, they found what's called a penumbra of rights. In other words, sort of an umbrella of Hmm. rights that are civil rights, that are human rights. And they said that a woman has the right. And at that point, they termed it in terms of the trimesters uh, and has the right certainly in the first trimester to end the pregnancy as she would see fit. And when that happened, what that did, the effect of that, was to overturn the laws that many states and localities had that restricted abortion. Now, it isn't the case that abortion has always and everywhere in every way been restricted. That's a very complex discussion, uh, which we'll talk a bit about uh, here, the whole history of of abortion, uh, the question of the criminalization of abortion, the question of the legalization of abortion. But it, it is the case that at the point in 1973, when Roe was handed down, it is the case that many states and localities had, for a variety of reasons, prescribed uh, induced abortion as contrary to law. 
And so what this ruling of the Supreme Court did was in a moment, if you will, uh, the uh, those laws were struck down in all the localities. And that didn't end something. Uh, you may be familiar with, well, you may not be, but I was just talking about it in church history. The Council of Nicaea in 325 didn't end all of the debates about whether Jesus was of the same substance with the Father. They continued to debate these things. And so when this decision was handed down by the Supreme Court, it isn't, oh, well, the abortion debate, if you will, is over in many ways. Mm-hmm. It was just beginning. Mm-hmm. And a whole debate began that's gone on for almost 50 years. A, does the Constitution actually contain, particularly in the substantive due process clause of the 14th Amendment and a perception of penumbra rights, which are gathered here and there from the Bill of Rights, does it actually contain a protection? Does it provide for uh, women under conditions initially that were, as I said, trimestered? Or Casey in 1992 actually overruled that trimester framework and uh, the so-called strict scrutiny standard that had been in and put in an undue burden test. That is, the state mm-hmm. couldn't unduly burden women who were carrying these children and that they had a presumptive right to end. Under certain conditions, there were always conditions. It was never, it was never held by the Supreme Court that one could, for example, uh, have an abortion up to the day of birth. And they certainly didn't hold that you could have, uh, you could allow what the old Romans used to allow, the exposing of infants, infanticide, Mm -hmm. uh, leaving them to die. So there were always restrictions on that. But what just happened in June of this year is Dobbs basically said that Roe and (laughs) Casey, other things, but particularly Roe, 1973, Casey, 1992, which said women have a, a constitutional right to an abortion. Dobbs said women do not have a constitutional right to an abortion. That case was wrongly decided, those cases. Roe was wrongly decided. Casey was wrongly decided. This is not in the Constitution, which, of course, means that this goes back to the localities, to states, to other kinds of localities to determine their own rules and regulations about abortion. It didn't say abortion is illegal throughout the United States. It said nothing of the sort. It simply said the Constitution doesn't, it's not a, it's not a constitutionally protected right. It's not a right that no state can regulate it. Now the states can regulate it, and those would have to stand the test. Yeah, it is interesting how, how some things did change uh, with Dobbs, and other things did not change. And like you say, there are still abortion clinics up and running, you know, um, performing abortions. Uh, and, and so clearly that didn't change. Although, like you say, there were some states that did have things on the books already. Some of those laws sprung back into effect. Isn't Michigan dealing with that right now? Yes. You know, many of our listeners are over in Michigan. We've got a lot of, a lot of friends over there and, and they're uh, dealing with a number of these things. But, uh, Immediately after uh, the repeal of Roe, of course, the airwaves were just, there was the, just this din of outrage. And, you know, a part of why we've uh, waited several months to even do this series is we didn't want to sort of come across opportunistically, you know, oh, we're just going to contribute more to the yelling match. No, we thought this is important for the church to talk about. And it's important uh, for us to think about biblically and also think about pastorally. But we need to make sure we're we're able to uh, do it without just being yet another voice in the in the yelling match. Right. We're committed here. Um, we like to think about and talk about a doctrine called the spirituality of the church. And the spirituality mm-hmm. of the church means, among other things, that the church as an institution is never to give way to pervasive politicization. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think many of our listeners understand that so much of our society has been more than ever in recent years pervasively and and thoroughgoingly politicized. I can remember, and I'm sure as our listeners can, 
not that long ago when you could go to a sporting event and you didn't expect the participants in the sporting event or activities that occurred at the sporting event to have a particularly political cast. It was understood that people at the event may be liberals, moderates, conservatives, and they could all happily exist and watch the baseball game, the football game. game. Exactly. (laughs) That's just a little bit of an example uh, of, of, of this pervasive politicization. And it presses upon the church. And the point is, is we're not in the church. And what we mean by the spirituality of the church is not that we're afraid to address the whole counsel of God. If the Bible says, as it does, that marriage is to be between one man and one woman for life, that's the that's what's set forth as the ordinary pattern. Now, we understand that there can be genuine and and legitimate cause for divorce and remarriage. But within that pattern, that's what's set forth, not same-sex marriage. Similarly, we would say, and and Dr. Compton, I, I just want to call him Dr. Compton. Yeah. Is, his wife is Dr. The, Compton, too. So, right. Um, She's not here. Is, uh, I'm not there uh, yet. <laughs> he's going to be talking more about the, the biblical evidence uh, for this. But we would say whatever the Bible says, the, the pulpit says, thus saith the Lord. And if the Bible says that uh, abortion is the taking of a life, same-sex marriage is unbiblical, we don't want to hesitate to proclaim that even from the full pulpit. But because of the spirituality of the church, we want to do everything we do, as Dr. Compton just said, not in the way the world does it, not with not to not as part of the cacophony of of shouted slogans mm-hmm. uh, in which we're just adding to the to the political polarization. Uh, we want to come and speak words as shepherds speak words. And the church at its core and heart is a spiritual institution. So we want to deal with this and we are dealing with this, but we want to make sure that we deal with it spiritually. And that's it's always tempting to, of course, we we bring political persuasions with us everywhere we go, and and let's be honest: in most of our confessional reformed churches, there is a conservative set of political commitments that go along with our conservative theological commitments. Right. But at the same time, even if we feel that in general, let's just say Republicans um, are being more consistent in a pro-life message. Um, now we've got things we can qualify uh, on on that, but if that's generally the case, that still doesn't mean we want to, as a church, say, therefore, the Republican official position on actual policies that are anti-abortion right. are necessarily the Christian ones. Right. Or this is the best way to do it. Right. That's something that's left... Uh, they may be to, to, to Christians <laughs> as not. as voters and citizens because mm-hmm. Christians are also they don't operate. Kuiper would put it this way: in just one sphere, the sphere of the church, they operate mm-hmm. in the sphere of family and state. And so Christians can can gather with other Christians. They can start organizations to oppose abortion, and they can have certain policies and plans, but it wouldn't bind every other Christian. In other words, Christians can have different ideas about the best ways to go about addressing the abortion situation, just as any kind of situation. Now, this is something that I found interesting. I was reading uh, I was reading John Frame on this, and John Frame was, I believe, one of the key figures on the abortion committee of the OPC. He was. Now, he had commented uh, just in his ethics um, ethics book, you know, and, and talking through some of that, but showing how there was there were some people who were even concerned about the OPC speaking to this because they thought, well, if Scripture doesn't explicitly condemn abortion as abortion, should the church, based on our commitment to sola scriptura, um, make a statement about that? And I think he rightly said, look, just because the word abortion or some exact Hebrew cognate or Greek cognate word is not used, uh, that doesn't mean the Bible doesn't clearly speak to the topic. And frankly, we would we would not be able to say anything uh, about the Bible if we didn't make those kinds of applications. But I, I was struck by that whole discussion. Uh, but I don't know if there's there's any comments you have. Uh, just being a, as uh, much of a church historian that you are, particularly an Orthodox Presbyterian one. 
No, I, I mean, I think that's correct. And, um, I, I think that, uh, our listeners should be primed now for perhaps the next <laughs> episode, which, uh, would be great to begin with some of these biblical considerations. It seems to me. Well, that will, uh, of course, be the highlight of my time here, me being uh, the not-so-not-so-knowledgeable American historian or constitutional historian or, uh, or historian of anything beyond the Iron Age. But anyway, when we turn to the biblical material, I think we can get into something that will not only be informative to us, but hopefully will even just get our help our listeners to be mindful of how it is we argue from Scripture in support of the life of the unborn. Next time, Reverend Compton and Dr. Strange examine what Scripture says about abortion. For more podcast episodes, you can find us on our website at midamerica.edu slash podcasts and wherever you listen to your favorite shows. Search for and subscribe to Mid-America Reformed Seminary's Roundtable. I'm Jared Luchibor. Till next time.